It took six years to get the platform ready to be dismantled. The government allowed BP to leave the base of the platform on the seabed, but the rest of it all had to go. By the end of 2008, the equipment and accommodation had all been brought ashore to be recycled. The oil industry is going to face a big bill for decommissioning over the coming years, and we're all going to feel the impact. In today's money, uh, uh, by, by 2035, uh, uh, it maybe the cost could be 26 billion pounds. Uh, that's the gross cost. And remember, uh, this cost can be set against tax. So we're all paying uh, 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 a, a lot for it at the end of the day. The most important thing we can do about decommissioning is to delay it. It's the right thing to do. How do we delay it? It's very simple. We must find ways to extract more oil and gas out of the reservoirs. With the cost of decommissioning starting to bite, the pressure was on to get more oil. But it wasn't going to be easy. The oil fields now being found were getting smaller and were often broken up into awkward sections by faults in the rock. To get at them, engineers needed to find a new way of drilling. If they could, the North Sea might still have a future. Most of the wells that were drilled in the early days were very simple, very short, vertical wells. What we do now is, is a huge departure from that. We drill wells that are, are horizontal and many, many kilometres long, getting within several metres of our targets. The drill can now be steered directly to its target. What basically happens is there's a cam inside the tool. A cam is basically it's a, it's a method of, of bending, the, bending the internal collar and that will bend it in one direction. And as it bends in one direction, it forces the, bit, the drill bit to point in another direction. Today, we can snake wells in and out of small hydrocarbon accumulations and really thread together pockets of oil and gas that were simply not possible to thread together with old drilling technology. As they get more accurate, they can access smaller pockets of oil. And while each one may be small, together they add up to a lot of oil. There's probably about 25 billion barrels left. The estimates vary. Uh, but 25 billion barrels is a huge resource. If we were to find in the world today a region that had 25 billion barrels left, we'd all be very, very excited. But much of this oil is to be found deep beneath the waters of the Atlantic, and the industry needed a way of getting it that they could afford. The problems of working here were enormous. What's unique about West of Shetlands is it's an extremely harsh environment. Um, extreme waves, extreme currents. And the depths of water west of Shetland posed another seemingly impossible challenge. Divers will be limited to about 400 meters at the very most at the push. So if we want to go deeper and the oil company want to go deeper because there is oil much deeper than 400 meters, then it has done to be done by ROV. The ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, was the key to unlocking the oil reserves of the Atlantic. Unlike divers, ROVs don't need to spend hours decompressing when they come to the surface. An ROV essentially can come up and down all day. Um, it's a lot cheaper, obviously a lot safer. And once they became established on the drill rigs for the drilling operations, um, people started to then realise their capability. And then they started to think up where we could use them for doing different things than, uh, than we'd perhaps anticipated. A new kind of ROV was designed to do simple jobs with articulated arms. You would have two types of arms. One, perhaps, would be fairly simple and would be used to secure the vehicle to the structure. And the other one would be more dexterous 
and it was operated obviously from the surface by the operator and they became pretty sophisticated devices to enable you to get the dexterity almost of an arm. The development of ROVs opened up new fields in waters far beyond the reach of human hands. And there was a new generation of underwater robot on the horizon. This vehicle will have its own intelligence, it will have its own navigation, it will know where it is, it will know what you want it to do, and it will then head off and do it. This intelligent beast became known as an autonomous underwater vehicle, AUV. Now this does sound a bit space age, um, but in October 2006, we did the first pipeline survey by an AUV. We see this technology as being game changing for the future. Smart technology was starting to make some of the smaller oil fields in the North Sea look very profitable. In 2008, the numbers looked even better when the price of oil hit $100 for the first time ever. Prices at the pumps have hit a record high, an average of five pounds a gallon. The impact on the public was immediate. Ridiculous. It's just, it's just going to go up and up, but everyone's going to need petrol. But it had a completely different effect on the oil companies. Their profits soared. The oil giant Shell has announced the biggest profits in British corporate history. BP has announced bumper results. Pre-tax profits are up more than 50% on the same period last year. But profits as big as this still throw up all sorts of questions. Are oil companies making too much? Should they pay even more tax? How should they use their billions? The question of what to do with the money from North Sea oil has become increasingly urgent ever since it was first brought ashore. Back in 1975, the country had been struggling with massive debts and declining industry. I remember the 1970s very well. I remember that it was a time when we, the country as a whole, was hugely overborrowed. We had declining industry. The spending um, profiles of government were very high. Uh, and we had to go cap in hand to the IMF. I think the oil industry was the saviour of the country and has been for the last 30 years. Revenue from North Sea oil may have bailed us out in our time of need, but some now argue we could have made better use of it. I think when people look back, people will realise that these, this asset was wasted. If you look at it, to, in comparison with what benefit it could have brought, it was wasted by the Thatcher policy. The first oil revenue came in under the Thatcher government. Her administration benefited from billions of pounds a year of oil taxes, but they had a pressing financial need. When we got into office, the economic picture generally was very bad, and there were two, only two industries at that time which were doing well. The banking industry and North Sea Oil. The oil revenues enabled us to reduce the budget deficit faster than we otherwise would have done. There is another view that oil is an irreplaceable national resource and we shouldn't have spent the proceeds so freely, but should have saved them in a fund for the future, as other countries have done, like Norway, whose oil fund is now worth billions. If we had carried on with the policy which had been begun, the North Sea Fund had been set up and used for industrial development. If we had extended, as we could have done, more and more control and ownership of the oil, then, of course, we would have become potentially as rich as Norway, and it would have been a different story. The story of North Sea oil is not over yet. Over the decades, more than 300 workers have died, and it remains one of Britain's most dangerous industries. North Sea oil and gas still provide the country with most of its energy. The men and women 
who made that happen, have taken part in an extraordinary national adventure and achieved spectacular feats of engineering in some of the most challenging conditions in the world.